Uh, of course, Stuart Nash. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I stand to speak in support of the tariff New Zealand Hong Kong China Closer Economic Partnership Agreement Amendment Bill. Quite a long name. But the reason I support this bill, Mr. Speaker, is because it will hopefully lead to increased opportunities for New Zealand exporters in the Hong Kong market, as well as strengthening our relationship in the Asian region in general. Closer Economic Partnerships, or CEPs, you'll find that trade is full of these acronyms, acronyms are a vital part of New Zealand's economic development policy as they work to break down tariff, quota and customs duties which restrict access and profitability for New Zealand exporters and importers. They tend to lead to increased exports and imports and the potential for added wealth to both countries. New Zealand signed a CEP with Hong Kong on the 29th of March 2010 and this bill implements that agreement. This closer economic partnership agreement had its roots in the work of former Trade Minister Jim Sutton and the next elected Prime Minister of New Zealand, the Honourable Phil Goff, during his tenure as Trade Minister. And whilst we tip our hats to Mr Grocer for getting this bill across the finishing line, I think that even he would admit that it is a result of the work of his predecessors and therefore we must recognise the efforts of those who have worked on this in the past to get it to this point. Trade is one of those wonderful areas where we all turn to work together and when it comes to securing the national interest. How to grow trade is the real challenge that the National Party just don't seem to get, as is evidenced by the latest budget. However, Mr Speaker, that is a story for another day. So what are we talking about when we debate the close economic partnership with Hong Kong? Well, Hong Kong is currently our ninth largest export destination accounting for $823 million last year. New Zealand imported $199 million of merchandise goods from Hong Kong last year, making it the 31st largest source of imported goods. However, to put it into perspective, Hong Kong accounts for only 1.9% of New Zealand's total exported goods and 0.04% of total imported goods. And here, Mr Speaker, lies the challenge for this economy going forward. Our ninth largest export destination only counts for 1.9 per cent of New Zealand's total exported goods. If there is ever a case for global diversification, then those figures are in it. It is also a very strong argument for this type of free trade agreement. It puts potential trading partners on the map and onto the radar of New Zealand trade and enterprise, as well as potential exporters. Despite Hong Kong's small size, it is a market which is already rapidly expanding, with last year's total exports increasing by 33.6% compared to 2008. However, the total imported goods declined by 2.5% last year compared to 2008. Now, what sort of things do we bring in from Hong Kong? Well, the exports. We actually do about $200 million worth of crustaceans into Hong Kong. We export. The area of the largest growth was actually apples, which would be good for the people of Hawke's Bay, considering we're the fruit bowl of this country. Uh, other things that increased was milk powder, uh, venison, frozen meat and frozen beef, the second and third in terms of um, export value. Uh, milk powder had actually dropped, which I was interested to see, and as said cheese had actually dropped. But there's some interesting products around there, and we're doing quite well. Now, in terms of imports, Mr Chair, the largest, imported, uh, the largest area of imports is actually machinery parts. And that accounts for about $16 million, but that actually dropped by 15%. The area that increased by 217% was printing machinery. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah no, I suspect that might have been one or two capital uh, purchases, but I'm not too sure. But insecticides, $4 million, increased by about 400%. And believe it or not, spectacles, increased by 118%. Some of those... Uh, some of those colleagues, not colleagues, some of the guys over on that bench need some spectacles from Hong Kong because they see the world through road spectacles and uh, don't, don't understand reality out there, unfortunately, Mr Hughes. Absolutely. But, but not only is Hong Kong an important market in its own right, as outlined a couple of minutes ago, but it provides a vital foothold for New Zealand businesses when expanding into the much larger Chinese market. Building closer economic relationships with Asia is also vital to New Zealand's future economic prosperity as these are the major markets of the future. This CEP is another step in that direction. So hats off to Jim Sutton and Phil Goff. While free trade agreements and closer economic partnerships come with undoubted benefits, we must not ignore that for some businesses, 
and sectors they can potentially cause harm. The CEP has been evaluated as having a low negative impact on New Zealand business, largely because Hong Kong specialises in services rather than cheap manufactured goods, which could undercut local businesses. New Zealand manufacturers of footwear, textiles, etc. are most at risk from FTAs and CEPs, and this CEP has given those sectors the longest phase-out period of tariffs to allow them time to adjust. We also need to be aware that there are fiscal costs associated with this sort of agreement, and these need to be fully understood so as to ensure that they are outweighed by the benefits. As with any FTA, the results in the reduction in tariffs, there will be, terms, there will be lost tariff revenue. In 2008-2009, the estimated tariff revenue collected on imports from Hong Kong was around $4 million. This will be faded out by 2016, so there will be no revenue collected from Hong Kong imports. Mr Speaker, I would like to outline some of the advantages of the CEP agreement. While Hong Kong already offers duty-free imports for all countries, the CEP will ensure New Zealand's existing duty-free access is locked in for New Zealand exports, giving New Zealand exporters added certainty that competitors other than mainland China do not enjoy. The phase-out of certain remaining domestic duties may also reduce some costs for New Zealand producers who use imported Hong Kong components or capital equipment. For instance, components or equipment across electrical transformers, whiteware and steel areas. And it's actually interesting to note one of the largest export um, products we do is recycled plastic. So they obviously turn it into added value and they bring it back here. Pity we can't do it here. The CEP provides New Zealand with the early harvest of most of Hong Kong's Doha services commitments. I, Hong Kong is offering to New Zealand, now through the CEP, most of what is offering the WTO membership in the yet-to-be-concluded Doha negotiations. The commitments that Hong Kong makes to New Zealand in the CEP address service sectors of key export interest to New Zealand, including education, business, environmental and logistics services. New Zealand export, uh, service exporters have also secured strong future proofing of their position in the Hong Kong market through the most favoured nation treatment and a ratchet clause. Most favoured nation treatment means that New Zealand exports will automatically benefit from any preferential treatment that Hong Kong provides to future FTA partners, subject to certain reservations and exceptions. And the ratchet clause means that any future unilateral liberalisation undertaken by Hong Kong in certain sectors will be bound and, and committed to New Zealand. We don't lose, we can't lose. New Zealand will be using the same tariff reduction schedule as the New Zealand-China FTA, which was also negotiated by, uh, by the Honourable Phil Goff, for imported products from Hong Kong. And as I already mentioned, the longest tariff trade-out uh, phase-out periods will apply to industry sectors in New Zealand that are particularly sensitive to potential imports from Hong Kong, such as textiles, clothing and footwear. Delayed tariff phase-outs will apply to other products such as steel, furniture, plastics and rubber products. Now, very quickly, I'll go through some of New Zealand's legal obligations under the CEP. These include identical tariff reduction phasing as provided to China, market access and national treatment commitments to Hong Kong service providers similar to those provided in the P4, and this is Brunei, Chile and Singapore, along with some elements provided in other recent FTAs and a few commitments drawn down from New Zealand's Doha offer or the domestic policy settings, of course. A reciprocal commitment to extend most favoured nation treatment to Hong Kong in relation to services subject to specified reservations. Doubling the overseas screening regime threshold from existing WTO levels of 10 million to 20 million. Commitment not to take trade remedy actions in an arbitrary or protectionist manner and to carry out trade remedy actions in a transparent manner. Specific ROO to accommodate part processing of certain clothing products in mainland China with robust verification procedures to mitigate any risks from this approach. And commitments on temporary entry of Hong Kong business visitors that go beyond New Zealand's existing WTO recommendations. Mr Chair, Mr Speaker, this is a good bill. It's a cross-party bill. We'll all support it. I think it will benefit New Zealand. And for that reason, I commit it to the House. Thank you.